you, you have said that you have a home child in your ancestry. Do you know which babies is that from? Bernardo's, Warriors, Bernardo's, okay. Warriors, okay. Warriors. All right then. This this talk is going to be focused more on the Warriors organization than others, but uh, they're pretty much the same as the others. But anyway, thank you very much for inviting me, and I'm blown away by the number of people that have come out to see me talk. <laughs> Anyways, my father was home touch. He came from Warriors in 1930. Now, William, who was seven at the time, he went out to work. And he worked placing the ornamental heads on pins in a factory working six days a week, 10 to 12 hours a day. And for this lovely, tedious work, he got a total of one shilling a week. Later, he was apprenticed to a high street shoemaker, but that was not to last because that business went bankrupt. Another place was found for him, this time in Paisley, just west of the city. And you'll notice on your maps, on your handout, I've highlighted green at Glasgow, Paisley, and Bridge of Weir. Now, he ended up being a journeyman shoemaker by the time he was the age of 12. And he worked for a number of shoe shops over the next four years, and then he began to work for a Mrs. Hunter, who had a shop on Argyle Street in Glasgow. And it was her positive influence that uh, made him declare his Christian faith. And he'd heard about God, who took care of the children. But this led him to wonder, however, why this good and kind God didn't come down from heaven and help the widows and the fatherless. His life was forever changed on a cold November night in 1864. He was on his way home from work and came across a small boy. He'd been robbed of his stock and his earnings by an older boy. Poirier comforted the lad, gave him enough money to replenish his supply, but never put the incident out of his mind. A month later, Poirier began a shoe glass brigade. Boys were issued shoe shine kits, the cost of which would be repaid, and they would go to school during the day, or they would work during the day and attend school and Sabbath school in the evenings. And they had to go to Sabbath school at least once a week. Because he was a real stickler for uh, going, to, going to church. And so it began. He was busy with work, the organization of the brigades. He had his wife, Isabella, who incidentally was the uh, daughter of his uh, former employee employer Mrs. Hunter, and he married her on December 2nd, 1856, and had four children, and had taken in uh, his younger sister's children because uh, she and her uh, husband had both died. So he had his own kids and his sister's kids, and his wife, his brigades, his own work, and he was still wanting to do more. In 1871, Thomas Corbett, a London businessman, came on board with the promise of funding for a home for destitute boys after reading Poirier's letter that appeared in the Vasco Herald and the North British Daily Mail. It was that year that the first boy stepped through the uh, doorway of the uh, shelter in the Renfrew Lane. Lack of space and separate housing for girls led to the boys being transferred to larger premises, Cessnock Home, and the girls to the Renfrew Street Home and laterally to another house on Govan Road. On July 2nd, 1872, 35 boys come out to Canada with a group of children under the charge of uh, any person. Before leaving, each boy was presented with a Bible, a copy of Pilgrim's Progress, a purse, and a good pocket knife. In addition, they were all given canvas bags containing a cloth suit, two linen suits, four shirts, four pairs of socks, a box of collars, a writing case, and a band of hope pledge card. In the first narrative of facts of Penn for his orphan homes of Scotland, Gloria wrote, When I was a little boy, I stood in the high street of Glasgow, barefooted, bareheaded, cold and hungry, having tasted no food for a day and a half. And as I gazed at each passerby, wondering why they did not help such as I, a thought passed through my mind that I would not do as they when I would get the means to help others. In 1876, William Porter was able to purchase in an auction knitting silk barn <coughs> near Bridge of Weir, some 14 miles west of Glasgow. He envisioned a central building, a school, work, and workshops surrounded by cottages long, large enough to house 
20 to 30 children in each, boys in one under the care of a house mother and house father, girls in another under just a house mother. Summer Weir, Weir Hall was the first building erected and in the beginning it served as a church, as a school, and provided sleeping accommodations on the upper floor. Without, but within 20 years of the Nittings Hill Farm Purchase, the village had grown to 37 cottages, a church, a school with faculty housing, a laundry, coach house, a training ship, poultry farms, stores, and housing for invalids. Now, with the exception of one cottage, number four, the donors were able to name the buildings whatever they wanted. But cottage four, they wanted to name it for your home, and he would have no part of that. In his eyes, it should, the house belonged to God, and so he would have nothing to do with the naming that cottage after him. So they uh, compromised and they named it Home League. And when I made my first trip over in 1993, that was being used as a courier's administration office. Okay, between 1872 and 1938, 7,000 children who were admitted to courier's had come out to uh, Canada. Thousands others to locations throughout their homeland. In 1888, William Poirier bought a home in Rockville from William J. Gilmore and George T. Fulford to use as his receiving home. He called it Fairno. Now, anybody that's from Rockville has probably heard of the Fairno Apartments. Well, that's Fairno Home. This home was run by his daughter Agnes and her son, her husband James Burgess. Prior to the children coming to Canada, the children were sent to a Marchmont home in Belleville. And also, unlike his contemporaries, William Poirier never openly solicited for funds. He firmly believed the Lord would provide, and the simple notation in his annual narrative of facts was all that the, he ever did. And if there was a surplus on one project and another in deficit situations, the funds were not to be transferred. He had an indenture that was to be signed by those taking in the children into the new country. And in addition to what the standard indenture of the time said, his added the phrase, and treat him as one of their own. <coughs> Superintendent of Fairno Home, Guardian of and of Township, who takes the child, agrees to give him good clothing and schooling and treat him as one of the family until able to earn wages and agrees to give him so many dollars per month, or so many dollars per annum with washing and mending for the first year, increasing annually the proposed increase in wages to be submitted for the guardian's approval at the end of each year. Also agrees to send this boy to church and Sunday school regularly, and today's school for the full school year until 14 years of age, <coughs> according to the requirements of the Canadian school law. The person taking this boy must see that he writes to his friends occasionally and to the homes at least once a year and must immediately notify the superintendent of any change of address or in the event of sickness. The boy must on no account be transferred to any other person or removed out of the province without consent of the guardian, but he can be returned to the home if he does not suit by sending a notice fortnight beforehand. We on our part reserve the right of removing him on these conditions not being fulfilled, or if we see fit, the other party to the contract will be held liable for any legal or other expenses incurred if this boy is not sent back when requested by us in writing. The quantity and quality of clothing must be maintained, and the undersigned of the second part hereby agrees to make up any deficiency by clothing or money if the boy is returned or when beginning to work for wages. An accurate account is to be kept of money expended for clothing, etc. The account is to be made up yearly, a statement sent to the home, and any balance deposited in a savings bank in the boy's name. Railway fare to be paid by the person getting the boy and not deducted from his wages. Full right of entry of the premises to see the boy, but also to remove him without legal process, is reserved. So he didn't monkey around. Families were screened and each child was to be visited by government representatives. But the size of the country and the number of children being sent out made that impossible to uh, complete. Porter himself traveled to Canada with the idea of uh, 
visiting every child that he'd sent out. But it was just too daunting and he couldn't do it. Now, when it was discovered that the home William Courier was born in was going to be pulled down, the stone arch from the doorway was salvaged and reassembled in Courier's village. And it stands just inside the main gate on Faith Avenue and is now their war memorial. Courier's Canadian family is an organization whose members are surviving home children and their descendants. And I'm sorry to say there's not too many surviving home children left from the Courier's organization there. We lost one two years ago and she had reached the age of 100. I think she hung around that long just because she wanted to get a letter from me. <laughs> and she did. And she was a lovely lady. Loved her to bits. Now, we don't have any of the records from Courier. They used to have them here. Now we've heard conflicting stories that uh, they got destroyed because uh, it was when the Children's Aid was taking over the running of Fairno. We've heard that uh, Claude Winters, who was the superintendent at one time, his daughter destroyed them when she was cleaning out her garage. But nonetheless, they got destroyed because people thought that there was duplicates being housed in Scotland. Now, you're not totally sunk because if your ancestor came through the Orphan Homes of Scotland of Couriers prior to 1888, you can get their records from Bernardo's, because that's part of the March Home collection. If your ancestor came before the 1911 census, you might be able to find them there. The National Archives ha has a wonderful site, thanks to uh, John Sayers and the British Isles Family History Society, who have been indexing uh, and digitizing the uh, past records. <coughs> They've got most of them done now, and have a great I don't think there's too many years left that they haven't got. 